Fantastic. Good morning and welcome to the third Homes the Hub webinar on post-acute care strategies. I would just like to review some general housekeeping items with you all before I pass this off and we get started, just in case you're new to this platform. The slides were sent out this morning to those that were registered. If you registered late, you can also access the handouts in the handout section of the GoToWebinar platform. This webinar is being recorded so it can be shared with others who are unable to attend live. We do ask that you please dial in using the telephone option if you are able. You will be prompted to enter your audio pen, and this will allow us to have a discussion at the conclusion of the webinar. At this time, all participants are muted and all panelists are unmuted. If you do have a question, we ask that you hold that question until the end of the webinar, but you may ask a question in two different ways. One, you may raise your hand using the palm with the arrow on it in the GoToWebinar platform. Hopefully you can locate that now, and I ask that you practice using it so we can be sure you can ask questions later. It is located on the left-hand side of the Grab tab. Please do this if you are dialed in with the telephone only. If you are dialed in with either your computer's audio or using the telephone, you may ask a question by accessing the Questions platform, which is also located on the tab menu. And with that, I'll turn this over to Abraham Segrist, Vice President of Quality and Patient Safety for the DHHS. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of our Home is the Hub webinar series that's focused on reducing readmissions across the state of Virginia. Just um, as a way of a reminder, um, the Virginia Healthcare Hospital and Healthcare Association is an association of all of the hospitals and health systems across Virginia. Um, we have a shared vision that through the power of collaboration, we will be the recognized driving force behind making Virginia the healthiest state in the nation. In 2014, the Board of Directors um, underwent a strategic planning process in which they identified four areas of collaborative improvement. Um, and the priorities that they identified are listed on the screen in front of you. Um, of course, the webinar series we're engaged in is focused on um, our priority related to hospital readmissions. And this morning, we'll be talking specifically about post-acute transfer readmissions but the association is also working with hospitals around the state to reduce healthcare acquired infections, specifically those related to C. difficile. We're also working collaboratively together to improve the patient experience as measured by the HCAP survey. And then finally, we're working together to identify and reduce serious safety events in all Virginia hospitals. In regards to our readmissions work, that has been done under the purview of our Home is the Hub initiative, which started in um, May of last year. For those of you that have been, uh, been with us since then, you'll recall that last year, working in conjunction with our um, content advisor, Dr. Amy Boutwell, we introduced our high leverage strategies related to post-acute transfer readmissions, multi-visit or high utilizer patients, and toll hip, toll knee readmissions. We partnered with our statewide quality improvement organization, HQI, and then we led a series of webinars last year in which we provided specific information regarding our high leverage strategies and then ended the year with an in-person session here in, at our offices in Richmond and a meeting with our skilled, skilled nursing facility association. This year, we've continued the statewide learning effort, and um, we started in January with a deep dive webinar related to emergency department strategies. Um, we continued with a presentation from one of our payers, Anthem, in February. In April, we talked about community health, community health workers, and today we were talking about post-acute care transfer readmission. The association is very proud to be sponsoring today's webinar with our skilled nursing facility partners, the Virginia Healthcare Association. Um, I will now turn it over to April, who will talk about the work that we, the VHHA, are attempting to engage um, with, um, with our skilled nursing facility partners um, through the VHCA. So April? Um, welcome, for, and thank you for being with us this morning. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning, and thank you to everybody who's joined this morning to talk about this collaborative effort. 
Um, so uh, the Virginia Healthcare Association and the Virginia Center for Assisted Living, our mission is um, to is collaborating to enrich lives, and I think that this um, this initiative really fits well into into what our mission is um, as an association for long-term care providers across the state of Virginia and across the country with our national association. Um, you know, recognizing that hospital readmissions have that impact on residents. Um, um, both negative for uh, physical, emotional, psychological impact um, uh, within the skilled nursing care centers, um, but also the high cost that it, um, it leads to for, for Medicare dollars. Um, so preventing these um, readmissions to hospitals whenever possible, you know, we recognize is a, is a top priority for CMS and managed care programs. Um, so you'll, you'll see here on the screen that we have um, part of the, the national quality initiatives, um, the very top one for the short term and post-acute care um, is, uh, is hospital readmission. So we are, we are striving to reduce the number of hospital readmissions within 30 days during a skilled nursing center stay. Um, and, and to do that, I think that, that the collaboration between hospitals and skilled nursing centers is extremely important. Um, we are very excited to show these efforts um, and, and show where the profession is um, showing ongoing efforts to improve the lives of individuals while reducing hospital um, health care costs. So um, that's, where, that's where we are at this point, and we're very excited about hearing from, from everybody on the call today. Well, thank you, Jeanette. Great. Oh. <laughs> Um, thank you again, April, for being with us. Um, a slight um, modification to the end of our webinar th um, today. We're glad to have both hospital and skilled nursing facility representative with us. And at the end of today's webinar, we've added a few additional minutes, a few additional minutes, um, during which time we hope to solicit discussion and feedback from those of you that are able to stay with us. So, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn the rest of the. Um, this morning's presentation over to Dr. Amy Boutwell, who's been working with us for the past year um, on this topic. So Dr. Boutwell, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Abraham, and thank you, April. Um, what, what a great um, uh, gathering this is of um, providers and organizations who uh, really have a shared interest in promoting patient care as well as uh, improving value and improving transitions across settings. So today, as, uh, as stated, today is a deeper dive into strategies to improve care transitions between hospitals and post-acute care and for patients specifically discharged from hospitals to post-acute care settings. Um, and again, for those of you who um, uh, have not been with us throughout the entire Home is the Hub uh, initiative, I just want to um, set the stage that um, uh, there is a lot of valuable background information that you might want to reference from the June 2006 um, Home is the Hub launch where we talked about high leverage strategies and improving transitions um, uh, for patients who are discharged into post-acute care settings, skilled nursing facilities, and home health care uh, settings. Uh, we put some numbers around that with Virginia numbers. Um, and um, and uh, really kind of uh, made the case, if you will, for why, you know, what brings us together here today. In addition, I'd like to just uh, remind anyone who doesn't remember or who didn't attend the September 2016 Home is the Hub webinar. Uh, I will con that was our, um, our overview. It was uh, an, our overview of uh, a wide variety of strategies to, uh, that have been um, effective in the field to improve care transitions for patients discharged into uh, skilled nursing facilities. There's tools, there are examples from outside the state of Mar uh, Virginia, et cetera. And, um, and today, the reason why I set the stage is because today is going to be a deep dive. We'll refresh a couple, uh, we'll refresh on some data, some updated data and some um, types of best practices. And then what we're going to do is we're very lucky to hear from Mary Catherine Colbert and her uh, collaborators um, in, in her 
Smith Network um, to go really deep and detailed into their story and their journey. So again, um, for those of you uh, who, who might look for um, a, a more of an overview, I reference uh, the September webinar, and today is a deep dive uh, into the details, the how-to, the benefits, the considerations of how uh, the Bon Secours system has worked to build and strengthen uh, the partnerships with their skilled nursing facility partners. We'll then, of course, have time for discussion, and, and I'll conclude this part of the webinar before uh, uh, the extended discussion with a few uh, recommendations. The objectives um, uh, of, this, uh, of uh, this part of the presentation are really to have you uh, understand in detail the steps that one system has taken uh, to build effective collaborations between hospitals and SNF. Um, and we really want uh, to, to flesh out all of the leadership, organizational, quality improvement, patient care, logistical components of this example so that you can take from this example uh, the principles that you know would, will undoubtedly apply to your your own your own organization and your own patient population. I really hope that you challenge yourself to write down, be an active participant in this webinar and write down three practical steps you can take at your organization, whether you're a hospital, whether you're a skilled nursing facility, or any other provider type. Uh, there will be lessons learned that all of us can take away from the Bon Secours uh, example uh, to, uh, in order to advance the um, collaborations between hospitals and skilled nursing facilities across the Commonwealth of Virginia. So moving here into some refreshed and updated uh, uh, data resources that we're so lucky to have from uh, the Virginia QIO, and thanks to our partner Car Carla Thomas for um, bringing these to our attention for today's webinar. The first is everyone loves to see a picture, and a picture tells a thousand words. And so uh, I know that that you you might want to after this webinar blow blow these images up and look closer at your regions and your communities, but um, to orient you to the graphics here that you're seeing on the left hand side is we have, if you will, the heat map of readmission rates for, now this is limited for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries, but that's really much of who we are thinking about in today's webinar. Uh, this, this, this is the map of Virginia and showing us here on the left-hand side uh, the readmission rates at a zip code level um, across the Commonwealth. And so you can probably intuitively see that red uh, red and orange are higher readmission rates, and green is lower readmission rates uh, here on the legend. You might also notice on this left-hand side that um, there are uh, some blue outlines of regions of the Commonwealth, and those are uh, uh, annotations that uh, you might just want to take notice of if you live in any of these regions outlined, um, or even the regions that are not outlined, uh, because these denote the communities that Carla Thomas's team at Health Quality Innovators, the QIO, um, that, that they're supporting in their readmission reduction work. And so um, you have uh, Carla's email here, and we have her with us today um, uh, uh, if you want to ask some questions in chat. But there are other support that's being provided to communities in these regions to help reduce readmissions, including reduce readmissions for uh, hospital to SNF uh, transitions. And this is the genesis of where this information comes from. Now, turning over here to the right-hand side of the screen, uh, this is new, uh, at least I, I had never seen this before uh, Carla uh, provided it to us recently. And this is the map of readmission rates just for patients discharged to skilled nursing facilities. So this, this again, to reorient you, Medicare fee-for-service discharges from an acute care hospital to a skilled nursing facility. They, they know that through the billing codes. Um, and they're able to see, um, again, uh, on a, a statewide basis, darker blue would be higher readmission rates. So um, really interesting to kind of compare and contrast uh, the two maps, and particularly for today, 
take a look at your region of the Commonwealth and see um, to see what shade of blue, if you will, you are. You'll notice the little the little yellow dots that denotes hospitals, um, and so um, that's that's just what you see there in the yellow. Really neat slide. Another really neat slide. Uh, again, I had never seen this before, and I think there's so much food for thought here in this visual. So let me walk this through with you. The what we're seeing here is um, the um, histogram, basically, of the day, the day, the amount of days between hospital discharge and readmission uh, that occur. You know, when we look at a 30-day time period. So the first graph is statewide all Medicare readmissions. And so what you can see is when we ask ourselves, of all the 30-day readmissions that occurred in Virginia, how many occurred on day one post-discharge, day two post-discharge, day 14 post-discharge? And you could add this up to say how many, occur, how many readmissions or what percentage of readmissions occurred within a week of discharge, et cetera. So that's the top histogram. And, and, and we always see this. Uh, in every state, at every hospital, uh, across the country, the top pattern is a general pattern. We always see that, um, interestingly, the most readmissions always occur in those days immediately following hospital discharge. That's kind of the bounce back concept, if you will. Um, and so, uh, so it's always common to see the highest bars on a statewide or hospital-wide graph uh, be highest in those few days following discharge and lowest out in the further days, you know, days 20 to 30. Well, very, very interestingly, uh, and this is the power of data to inform improvement right here, is uh, HQI and Carla's team uh, gave us a example from, um, of the same question asked for patients who were discharged to a specific SNF in Virginia. And so what we see here is that yes, you know, yes, we see that um, spike, if you will, at day one, but then we see a very different pattern across the 30 days. And, and although we might not all have insights into exactly what's going on, it sure is, uh, provides us with a lot of food for thought and a lot of idea generation around how and when we need to be particularly aware of watching for readmission risks among patients who go from hospital to SNF and often SNF uh, to home. And so when I look at this, I see something that makes a lot of sense to my experience, both in as readmissions uh, students but also as a practicing doctor, which is I see that spike at day 24, which you would never see on this statewide map, which is the, the few days after a typical 20-day SNF uh, recovery period going home, and it's those few days after uh, that uh, the patient uh, doesn't have what they need, can't get what they need, a plan's not in place, appointments weren't made, uh, questions come up, uh, families get stressed and they bring their loved one right back to the emergency room and they end up getting readmitted. So this to me was one of the greatest ahas and greatest uh, examples of how local, specific, detailed information can really uh, shed a light on, um, on uh, opportunities for improvement and uh, in particular time points, again, as this graph illustrates, for being mindful of readmission risks and transitional care across a 30-day period of time. Oh, excuse me. So the next two graphs are going to be detailed. Or they're actually tables. The next two tables are detailed, and they're not meant for us to go over together. Um, what uh, what uh, we're so grateful to Carla and her team at HQI for doing is for, again, giving us an example report that's available um, uh, to teams that are working with uh, the QIO and quality improvement work to reduce readmissions and just uh, really provides food for thought um, uh, about the type of information we now have potential access to in terms of really understanding the flow of patients between hospitals, 
skilled nursing facilities, uh, back to the inpatient setting or the emergency room, et cetera. So what we see here um, is an example um, hospital report that, that would be provided by um, HQI to a hospital that's working with them. And, um, and we can see here in that top part of the table, the hospital-specific 30-day readmission rates for um, everyone discharged from the hospital to a uh, skilled nursing uh, facility. And it would have the hospital's readmission rate there in the light blue compared to the Virginia readmission rate for this group of patients in the yellow. So again, the hospital can see how are they tracking uh, compared to other, or to, to, to statewide averages, basically. So really, really helpful. The lower part of the, of the table is a little bit more detailed, probably, um, uh, 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 probably most interesting to the hospital folks on, uh, on the line, but it's new information. Again, I haven't seen this level of detail before, so it, it just shows the power of, uh, of uh, we're all getting so much better with our data, um, is that we can also see uh, in readmission work, you'll, mo most of you will be familiar with the idea that we're talking about an inpatient discharge and whether they were readmitted to the inpatient level of care. Well, you all know in skilled nursing facilities and at the front lines of hospital medicine, you all know that patients often come from the skilled nursing facility to the emergency room. And once in the emergency room, they might go back to the SNF, or they might go into observation level of care, or they might go back to inpatient, which would be the readmission. So when we only look at the top of this table, we're only seeing a part of the total flow of human beings between our facilities, right? When we look at this broken out, expanded set of data, we can start, at, again, asking ourselves, now wait a second, of, among everyone who's discharged to, to a skilled nursing facility, how many are coming back to our emergency room? And when they come back to our emergency room, are we able to treat and respond and return them to the SNF, as we'll talk about in some best practices? Or does it look like we're still kind of stuck in standard care, which says if they come to our emergency room, we pretty much most often readmit them, which again is what standard historical patterns have been. So thank you so much for this expanded view, really reflecting here the human flow, who's coming in between and amongst our facilities. This next table would be a table that would be provided to a skilled nursing facility um, again, uh, in, as an example table from HQI. So, so here you can see that um, this would be your facility's 30-day readmission rates for all Medicare patients who are discharged from an acute care hospital and admitted into your facility. So you can see that uh, this is quarterly data. Um, so. Uh, that speaks for itself over time, and, you, and you'd be able to see the number of residents admitted to your facility from acute care um, within 30 days of hospital discharge. So you could see that there in the definition on the left-hand side. And then let's just say, looking here at the most recent column of 70 uh, residents admitted to your facility, then seven experienced a readmission within 30 days of that hospital discharge. So it's still connected to the hospital discharge, which again, I'm, I'm going through this in some detail because um, uh, uh, this is information that a skilled nursing facility may not have. You know, um, you know about patient flow in and out of your facility, um, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder uh, to have information about readmissions with regard to the hospital discharge event. And that's what this table is able to show you. It's also then able to show um, how your facility ranks among other facilities in the Commonwealth. And again, um, recognizing that all facilities are different and you're serving a different patient population with often different clinical need types and different communities, et cetera. But again, many facilities like to just kind of have a sense of even though it's not an apples to apples comparison, it's, a, it's just an interesting uh, and helpful little bit of information. So again, great data. Uh, in, in prior webinars, we've talked about readmission rates from SNFs and, uh, 
uh, other types of patterns. So you could go back to the September 16th webinar for more information on um, SNF readmission if you patterns in general. Pivoting here now to um, uh, away from these latest and greatest data assets to um, some words about what appear to be promising, effective, feasible, and also creative strategies to manage care across settings. Really, in readmission work, no matter who the patient population is, what we are really doing is managing care across settings. And we have called that care transitions before, but as I get more um, experience and more, uh, as I learn more from successful programs, a transition is a great word, uh, but a transition kind of implies a little bit of a transaction. I'm going to do a better handoff. I'm going to do a better transition of the patient. And one thing I'd like you to think about as we, as I walk you through a few pointers on best practice, and then as we take a deep dive into the Bon Secours story, is is what part of this work is managing the transition from one provider to another? And what part of the success of the story is about managing care across settings and over time? So I bring that to your attention for consideration here throughout the webinar. So I'm going to share with you four practices that I've seen teams um, invest in and uh, find success in both improving the quality of the care transition as well as improving the measurable outcome of reducing 30-day readmissions from hospital to SNF and SNF back again. So practice number one, many of you have heard me extol the practice before. Um, uh, this is an um, innovation developed uh, in your, in, uh, by a neighbor, uh, a neighbor, a neighbor in a neighboring state, uh, Emily Skinner, a social worker um, at Carolina's healthcare system. And what Emily uh, was asked to do was uh, she was asked as a social worker to figure out some way to reduce the SNF readmission rate. Um, and uh, and so I, I I always share that because I think it's it's fascinating to reflect um, that this was a frontline clinician. She was asked to figure something out. She put she she thought outside the box. She really said, "What would it take in order to do a better job?" And this is what Emily came up with. And it's it's it, they call it the circle back um, uh, the circle back method. And I think it's one of the more ingenious. Um, innovations I've seen in a long time. So I'm skipping part of the process. The process starts with a warm handoff. So from the hospital um, nurse, usually, um, from the hospital nurse to a receiving uh, clinician at the skilled nursing facility, um, uh, usually a, a nursing director um, of some sort, depending on the size of the facility. So there's a warm handoff, a nurse-to-nurse -nurse report. Um, all nurses know how to do nurse-to-nurse -nurse reports, so we don't need to go into that. Uh, the, um, the, the from us is the patient and family satisfied with the transition and I think the most important question have we provided you everything you need to provide excellent care to the patient and of course I hope most of you in skilled nursing facilities will recognize uh, the innovation here that I see which is often um, in executing a handoff or a referral or a transition even uh, the sender is usually the one who decides what information the receiver gets. And when and and what Emily did, which is something that at, at the same time I was uh, testing in my own work, which is the transition needs to be, be defined not by the sender, but by the receiver. And the way the transition occurs, the information, the order in which the information is presented, the level of detail of the information, the way the information is conveyed, 
needs to be defined by what's going to work for you as the receiver of the information, not by us as the sender of information, if you will. So, um, so again, recognizing and honoring that in a successful transition, really the only thing that matters is if the receiver of care has the information they need to feel that they can now pick up uh, the care of the patient and move forward successfully. Emily, in testing this and then spreading it across the system, uh, shared that um, really improving transitions is about a, uh, is, is, is a process, that this really isn't about a form or a checklist, but she said this, the key to success here is in the intent. We need to really mean it, that we are trying to be helpful, we are trying to be responsive, we are trying to be a good partner. And um, if we derive down to a level of checklists, um, and yes, we checked this information box off and that information box off, she would be skeptical that the in true improvement would, have, would be achieved. It's really about the actors have to have the right intent. And that this type of, um, this type of transition and feedback loops is about iterative communication. Pick up the phone, ask questions, call, make improvements, make it better next time, learn from each other, um, and, and really I think uh, no, 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 no uh, wiser words have been spoken about what it really takes in order to execute a better handoff and transition from one provider to another. So similarly, um, I have had the fortune to study the what's called the Pioneer ACO programs. These are kind of the biggest and earliest ACO health system accountable care organizations across the country. And um, uh, emerging after uh, this circle back concept came uh, a concept that I saw many of the ACOs embrace early on, which is if we as an accountable care organization send a patient into uh, or uh, as, our, as our patient traverses the healthcare continuum, wherever that is, into a skilled nursing facility, into uh, home with home healthcare, into uh, home with primary care follow-up, uh, that the accountable care organization does a warm follow-up uh, with the receiver, and in our case for today, the SNF. So what, the, what I observed uh, many of the Pioneer ACOs do, um, early on, and this was as early opportunities to get that measurable success that they had to get in order to be successful in this accountable care model, is that they designated support staff from the accountable care organization who were available to really facilitate the logistics of um, communication and care collaboration once the patient left the hospital and went into whichever other facility they might go to, and, and always a number of facilities, right? That, that's the logistical challenge. And so support staff were key uh, to facilitating um, the ability to do something like a warm follow-up following uh, discharge from hospital to SNF. You needed someone to pull together, you know, where did the patients go, and to arrange uh, sometimes to, to connect by phone and which patients are we going to discuss, et cetera. So there's a lot of air traffic control and logistical support that goes into managing care across time uh, and, and, and settings. And then with the support of that logistical support person, then uh, principal clinicians, mostly nurses, would get on the, on the uh, phone together between the accountable care organization and the SNF, uh, uh, um, often one or more facilities at a time for efficiency, and do what we clinicians call, used to call, card flipping back, back when we would uh, use index cards for our patient notes. Um, but, um, but, but basically just run the list, talk about uh, how the patient's uh, progressing, any barriers, um, you know, any concerns, any changes in clinical status, um, any access to uh, specialty service issues that, that need to come up, and, and especially in anticipating and preparing for uh, the point at which the patient would then have another transition from SNF to home. So key lessons as I observed one uh, large um, Pioneer ACO uh, go through this journey of discovery is they, um, I think, acknowledged what is probably really productive for us all to acknowledge, 
which is it can take a while to, de to develop the collaborative rapport that we're truly seeking. Um, and they acknowledged, especially this particular hospital, large academic medical center, pretty, you know, big uh, name in healthcare, um, that it took a while to cast aside um, feelings uh, across the, the continuum with their, with their SNF collaborative partners that the hospital or the ACO was the big guy trying to dictate to the little guy. And that wasn't the intent. But of, of course, from appearances and history and, 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 you know, and just humans being humans, that was the way they tripped and started and had to bumble and work through um, the relationship building part. And so they really did acknowledge that a lesson learned for all of us moving forward is that we need to acknowledge and, and allow uh, for that relationship building, uh, the trust building, and the collaborative spirit to, um, to, to, to take hold. And this really isn't about anyone telling someone else what to do, but rather collaborating in this new task called managing care across settings and over time. And of course, just like Emily, they said, absolutely no substitute for verbal communication. Uh, they're not relying on checks and forms and protocols and templates. I mean, they have a process, but there's no substitute for verbal communication and joint problem solving. Uh, and that that's where they got a lot of their measurable success and uh, they continue to this day. Two more practices to, to orient you to um, briefly is um, then emerged the bundled payment programs um, and physician-led ACOs and, and, and you know, accountable uh, care in, uh, with entities that had to manage care over not only 30 days but 90 days in, in a year. And again, some key points that we're learning from across the country as well as from the example we'll hear from today is um, that uh, really when we want to get results, oftentimes I see in all of these stories, there's usually a dedicated team and there's a point person. There's some sort of coordinator. Again, like I said in the prior example, someone needs, this is a new task. It's a new management task. There's a lot of logistics. There's a lot of relationships. There's a lot of things to coordinate. And so oftentimes we do see a dedicated team um, and a point person that manages this part of this new, this new clinical care model. And that much of the ling language I hear among these teams is about co-management, um, whether that's physically going to the facilities and seeing patients and being a resource available to, to, to manage and respond while the patient is in the facility, or as the example before, virtual rounding via telephonic um, collaboration, there's, um, there's an emergence of uh, resources being mobilized to co-manage the patient, again, as they journey from one point in the continuum of care through uh, really now not only 30 days, but 90 days and a year for those in ACOs. Also, we see greater facility and greater um, uh, know-how, really, because again, it's mostly logistical, um, in moving the patient, quote, up the continuum. So this has been one very clever thing that those of you in bundles have probably seen, but um, uh, if, if we uh, uh, discharge somebody uh, from a hospital and they go home, but what they really need is acute uh, 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 skilled nursing care, or excuse me, uh, skilled nursing level of care, they can be moved from home to SNF. Uh, if they go from SNF to home and they're not doing well, again, let's not go back to the emergency room every time. As appropriate uh, and according to the rules of whatever uh, governs us, we see a lot of moving, quote, up the continuum, not always going through the emergency room in order to be uh, directed to another level of care. Finally, uh, a note about a very important opportunity for collaboration between skilled nursing facilities and hospitals. Often we think uh, about the transition from hospital to SNF and then what happens in the SNF or co-management and the transition from SNF to home. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not highlight how important it is to have a high functioning collaboration between the SNF and the emergency departments. 
And this um, brief story I've shared with some of you before, but some of you may not have heard it, um, was uh, an observation given to the chief of uh, emergency medicine at a hospital up here in, in Boston. And, uh, and <clears throat> basically someone uh, uh, from the skilled nursing facility actually association said, uh, gee, it looks like you, you know, no matter what we do with our interact and our quality improvement, it looks like you just automatically admit everyone uh, of our patients that come to you from SNF, you, you basically admit everybody. Uh, what's going on with that? And, uh, and he was open to the feedback and he, um, he decided to look into it. And again, very briefly, nimble, quick, this, this wasn't uh, overly extensive. He brought this to the attention of his 40-some uh, providers at a staff meeting and he said, look, we're getting feedback from the SNF Association that it appears like we're, um, we're not using these Interact forms and, and we're, we're admitting most people that come to us from the SNF. Um, why do you think that is? And he just asked why five times, if you will, and he got those working assumptions, the old assumptions, the, the perhaps incorrect assumptions that the providers make, oh, well, if the patient comes to us from a SNF, that means they can't take care of the patient or they can't do an IV or I heard nursing homes can't give breathing treatments or whatever old misconce misconceptions might be lingering. He got those out on the table and then he basically did, again, lean, uh, quick. He said, well, it turns out that, you know, the five uh, SNFs in our immediate locality, they're willing to take people back 24-7. They can most certainly do IVs. They can most certainly continue IV antibiotics. Uh, and he basically used those, the SNF capabilities form um, uh, to generally orient uh, the providers to the higher uh, level of capabilities that the facilities had than the providers had been aware of. And then he did this. He said, so now that you know that they can do more than you think they can, um, if you see a patient coming from a SNF, and you're, you know, they're, 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 they're not unstable and they're not acutely ill. Uh, if you, you know, diagnose and assess them in the emergency room and they can continue their care in the skilled nursing facility environment, then why don't you just think twice and whenever you can, send them back if you think it's safe and appropriate. So it wasn't heavy handed. It wasn't, you know, tied to their bonus structure. It was, you know, it was the invitation to, hey, think twice, see if you can send the patient back if you think it's appropriate, doc. And then you can see over this nine-month quality improvement period of time, uh, he measured the patients who were sent to the emergency room from a SNF. And what you can see here on the graph are the number of those patients month in, month out, who went back from ED to SNF. Thus, as you all can recognize, mostly avoiding almost all of these would have been readmissions probably of one type or another. So you can see, uh, again, um, engaging with the emergency room and treat and return is a wonderfully important pathway uh, to build out in your collaborations. So I have summarized here as we now move into our deep dive example from Bon Secours, I have summarized here some bullet points for you to listen for and uh, in the Bon Secours experience and think to yourself, um, whether or not you have any or all, some or all of these components in place um, in your work to promote better care and collaboration between hospitals and SNFs. So um, most successful stories include a shared, open, transparent, blame-free understanding and use of whatever best available data exists. We, we saw some beautiful data from the QIO. Uh, sometimes we've got beautiful data, sometimes we work with what we have. Uh, and in that last example, they just did simple counts. So you don't always need sophisticated data. You have a shared understanding of, hey, you know, who's coming from me to you and from you to me, and can we figure out why? Can we track it, trend it, review it, be open, transparent, blame-free, using data, as I said at the top of these remarks, as powerful insights to drive improvement, not for blame. Number two is to foster, again, a shared understanding of what matters to patients and caregivers. We know that many root cause analyses end up with something about what the patient or caregiver thought, needed, 
um, uh, you know, thought or needed uh, or did, um, whereas often as clinical teams, we think about our clinical decision making and we would be remiss if we didn't consistently remember to include a shared understanding of why do patients or their family or their caregivers um, uh, uh, either you know, want or, or don't want the admission. Next is, as I've elaborated upon, is a shared understanding of the receiver's perspective. Now, the receiver is not always the skilled nursing facility. We are all senders of patients, and we are all receivers of patients. So in the, in the situation where it's hospital to SNF, the SNF is, of course, the receiver. In the example of ED and SNF, it's the ED who's the receiver. And so again, Interact, for those of you who are familiar with that, has given us some good uh, pointers on how to execute a better transition and communication from SNF to ED, but there's a lot that hasn't been written in Interact about actually making that communication effective. Um, and, so, um, and so again, think about who the receiver is um, and make sure that whatever quality improvement effort we're making in order to transmit better information is always um, put in context of what does the receiver need to know and let's give the receiver what they need to know. Um, after we build relationship and trust, uh, which again takes, takes time and effort and needs to be fostered, we need to then clearly move to an action agenda. And so I've seen many examples across the country of hospital SNF collaborative efforts which kind of stalled out at the networking stage. And so my advisement is part of the beauty of being oriented in this type of a webinar and initiative around a measurable outcome like readmissions is that, again, once we foster those trust and collaborative relationships, we then need to clearly identify specific feasible improvement ideas that will reduce readmission, stay focused on the goal, and that will enhance your collaboration, not detract from it. Um, uh, and and what, what, what we don't want to do is bring together a bunch of networking events. Uh, that, that's good for other reasons, but if we're focused on reducing uh, readmissions, we really need to, to, to get into the work. Um, over time, hardwire the improvements you make into new standard operating procedures so that all new staff, all staff um, know what to do and when. And again, there's no substitute for meeting regularly and engaging in joint problem solving. Um, and uh, if again, if there's one thing that I hear uh, that is a uh, uh, causes good intentions to get stalled out, it's that we set a, a meeting schedule of meeting once a quarter. Um, and meeting once a quarter, I would call that the advanced maintenance phase. But if you are starting a collaborative undertaking, meeting, calling each other, uh, having fluid interactions, meeting at least monthly, um, uh, most stories start with more often than that. Um, but quarterly should only be when you have hardwired processes and you're really maintaining and optimizing what you've built. Okay, so with that as setting the stage, I'm now uh, thrilled to have you hear from Mary Catherine Colbert and her uh, SNF uh, collaborators um, on the deep dive into their story. Um, and, um, and so Mary Catherine, I'll turn it over to you and I'll just um, remind you that you've got you know, a full 30 minutes, so uh, take your time. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Boutwell, for this opportunity to talk about Bon Secours journey to building a SNF network. And I'll make sure I keep track of my time, too, because I want to make sure my other folks that I brought along with me have time. So just an overview about Bon Secours. Um, it is um, a large healthcare system, and we have our headquarters in Maryland. We're in six different states and three different countries. And in here in Virginia, we have eight hospitals in the Richmond and Hampton Roads area with about 750 providers. So Dr. Bowell wanted to make sure I told you all where I fit into uh, the system, the healthcare system. So I'm under senior services. My supervisor, Ellen Calhoun, is the administrative director of senior services for Virginia. And so my work is across the state. I'm headquartered in Richmond, but I do cover Richmond and Hampton Roads. 
Um, there are others like me in the Kentucky and South Carolina markets for Bon Secours, um, but they also do other work besides just the post-acute. My work, as my title says, the post-acute care coordinator, that's, that's all I do. Um, Dr. Bowell also wanted me to talk about how I got this job. I wasn't going to talk about that, but it's, it is different. Um, I am not clinical. I have no clinical background at, at all. Um, my prior job at Bon Secours was community outreach. And my background before that has been nonprofit service, either as a volunteer or as a leader in nonprofits. And in fact, my first job actually was in sales. I was in advertising sales for 15 years. So um, when they asked me to do this job, I think Bon Secours understood the importance of the relationship component of this work. And I was really, um, really blessed that they found um, a way for me to use my skill set in this way. And I've been doing this work for a little over two years, and it really has been nothing short of an amazing learning experience. As I said, I knew no clinical information, and I relied on my friends in the hospital. I work at uh, my offices at St. Mary's Hospital, the largest of the Bon Secours system, and I talked to all my nursing friends when I was hearing all the alphabet soup about all the work that we were doing, and I had no idea what they were talking about, but I've learned a lot in the past few years. So um, my job is really to be a conduit between the two worlds, between the hospital world and the SNF world. So. When I'm um, at the SNFs, I tell the hospital side of the story, and when I'm at the hospital, I tell the SNF side of the story, because I'm really trying to remove the us and them and for us to be uh, a we as far as uh, patient care. So the next slide just talks about how we're um, looking at taking care of our patients. Um, you guys can read around the circle. I'm sure this isn't new to anybody who's in healthcare, but we're just looking at our population, looking at what problems are um, issues they have and um, how we can engage the patients along the way and all the stops along the way to work better on that patient care and um, our post-acute network fits in with this just perfectly. So why did we decide on a post-acute strategy? Um, uh, we have the triple aim as I'm sure most hospital systems uh, do as you see on the left and if we accomplish all of that, all those wins, the patient's going to win and as I just said a minute ago, really trying to remove the us of a hospital and the them as SNFs and all become a we as, and really looking at what's best for the patient um, in all the settings. And if we focus on that, um, we'll have great success. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. I borrowed this slide from my friend Mike Pickles, who's the AD of Case Management for Bon Secours, Virginia. And he came up with a great concept about our work is really minding the gaps along the care continuum looking at where um, a patient might have a gap in service, and we really recognize that the patient leaving the hospital setting and going to the post-acute, whether that be SNFs or home health or home, there's a gap there. And then also then when the patient leaves that post-acute setting and going back to their home, there's another gap there. So we really wanted to look at ways on how to mine the gap and close those gaps so it is a continuum. You're going to hear from one of the community care team members that is a part of Minding the Gap, Taylor Evans, shortly, and she's going to really deep dive into how we're minding those gaps. So, of course, we are a hospital, so there's financial incentives for us to uh, uh, mine these gaps and to do this work on a post-acute strategy. So um, we um, are a part of an ACO, and we do have our Medi Medicare Shared Savings Program patients that we need to follow along the way. We also are involved in uh, lots of bundles. We have uh, the hip and knee at one hospital that we just added spine to that hospital as well. We have a CHF bundle at another, and two of our hospitals have um, shoulder bundles. So we all are looking at um, reducing utilization of the post-acute as well as reducing our length of stay. Um, and I'm sorry, back in the ACO too, I just for comparison, in Virginia we have about 200 lives, 200,000 lives that we're watching in the Medicare Shared Savings Program. And lastly, we have the uh, value-based purchasing um, and readmission reduction programs. All of this is leading us to have a better relationship with our post-acute partners. So now let's talk about how we built <clears throat> the post-acute network. So these are our focus areas that we worked on. Sorry, um, Mike, the next slide for me. Um, the next, uh, the focus areas that we um, looked at when looking at who to engage in our partnership. 
The first area we have there, you see the um, stratify um, facilities by quality and performance metrics. And I'm sure all of my SNF friends that are out on the call today understand that the star rating um, is very important for us to look at. Um, we had the three star rating as the minimum, and that really came from the bundle requirement of uh, going all of the bundle patients need to go into three star. But in my past two years of working, I have come to learn that the star rating system is one complicated, I don't want to say mess, but I don't say, I can't think of a better word right now. Um, and I just, and I think one of the biggest learnings is that I need to, to educate my hospital colleagues about the star system. And it's not the end all to be all as far as the rating of patient care for a SNF. There's a lot that goes into that. Unfortunately, it's the way a public looks at it, just like you look at a restaurant or a movie. The star ratings are what you look at, not really even knowing what goes all into it, but I've found that part of my job is really educating everybody on the hospital side about what goes into the star. But there's much more than that that we look at about, um, about not just the star rating. Um, the second area we, uh, for evaluation, we want to make sure that our SNFs have adequate scope of service uh, for our patients. And we have a uh, SNF evaluation form that I'll talk about in just a minute um, that we sent to our SNFs prior to um, visiting them. And um, the third area, which is unique, I feel, for Virginia, is that we um, have um, a good geographic coverage. As I said, we have eight hospitals. Uh, the four in Richmond are um, close together. The three in Hampton Roads are not necessarily. We have, um, you know, rivers that really split communities as well as, you know, tunnels and ocean, we just have a lot of geographical uh, considerations to take into effect about who we were going to include in the network. And the fourth area, which I think um, is one of the most important, I know data is very important, but the ability and willingness to collaborate with us as a partner was a huge consideration um, to us. We wanted people that wanted to work with us, get in the weeds, look at both sides of the equation and figure out how we can make patient care better. So when we looked at evaluating the SNFs, um, specifically we looked at um, um, the mission and vision, vision excuse me, of Bon Secours, and we wanted partners that aligned uh, with that same mission and vision. You know, if we had partners, and we said they were our partners, we wanted to be proud um, that, we, that they were our partners. Um, and data collection, we used a lot of resources. You can see on the slide that we used, and there's just a well, one-page example on the slide of that SNF evaluation form I talked about. Um, it's a seven-tab form. It isn't um, probably very enjoyable for the SNFs to fill out, but it really um, helped us compare each SNF side by side. And uh, we talk about um, therapy, staff, their quality and safety initiatives, their um, administration, nursing, clinical capabilities, had a lot of information on that form. We also gathered information from our internal sources, and which I feel was the most important was our case management staff. Um, these folks work with these skilled facilities every day, and they could really give us some inside information on how they were to work with, uh, response time, um, placement of hard-to-place patients, and I just can't emphasize enough how the networks really need to involve case management um, as a part of their team. And um, we also then looked at also where our uh, Bon Secours Medical Group had uh, docs as attending or medical directors. So then we looked at, after we got all this information back, we looked at um, the evaluation tools and uh, decided where we were going to go visit. So two years ago, um, I went on quite a tour of the state of Virginia. I think I visited probably over 40 different SNFs in a very short period of time. Um, but we really felt it was important to meet these people. Again, build relationships, meet them in their facilities. And, uh, as you can see on the slide about um, how long they were and who was involved from each side of um, the SNF and the hospital. Um, so when Bon Secours did show up, you see lots of people on that list. We kind of were um, a little bit of an army arriving at the SNF, but it was important for all the people along that are going to mine those gaps that they be present to hear firsthand about uh, the SNF and how they take care of patients. But I really felt it was important for the SNF to tell us firsthand, not just on paper, how they took care of their patients and residents at their facilities. 
and then we also took a tour around the building to look at the facility and um, just really see the space and um, see residents at the facility. So after all of the tour of Virginia, a summer's worth of uh, visiting SNFs, we then laid them all out side by side um, per hospital. Um, and you can imagine the spreadsheet that that made. It was quite something. Um, and we um, had everybody in the room that went on the site visits. And we uh, laid up against those four focus areas that you saw before. And um, we had conversations about each of the visits and what we felt. And again, I'm going to emphasize case management and their opinion as being critical uh, to this work. And as we go forward, you'll, I, I can't do my work without them. They are um, quite my um, aces in the hole, as you would say. I, I really couldn't do the work without case management. So once we decided um, who we were going to offer, um, who we were going to engage in a partnership, we um, put together a clinical service agreement which outlined how we would partner together. And we asked the uh, SNFs, um, eventually we came up with 28 in the state that we entered into partnership with, and we outlined how we would want to collaborate, the data we would share back and forth, and what, how we would um, conduct business as partners. So now that we have all these partners, uh, what are we going to do next? So we, um, what well, we do great at hospitals and all in healthcare, we had meetings. We had meetings. So um, we meet with them quarterly in two different um, ways, and then we meet with them one-on-one -on, -one on um, every month. So um, as I said, we do meet with them a lot because we want to share information about um, the hospitals and the SNFs. We really want to be able to talk a lot. Uh, um, so. When we first started this journey, even before we went on the site visits and visited all the SNFs in Virginia, we decided, uh, Bonsecor decided it needed a closer relationship with the skilled nursing facilities. So we started um, a collaborative, is what we called it. And we had um, meetings with all the skilled nursing facilities that we worked with um, at the hospitals. And we had them in Richmond and in Hampton, Hampton Roads. And we really just wanted to start the conversations. Um, and it was really at a very high level, 10,000 foot level, and um, it was a very interesting meeting. It was definitely, um, it was, it was a, a colder atmosphere because no one knew each other. This was the first time we'd really all brought both sides into the room. So um, the SNFs were all very quiet and sat with their own companies in small little pods and the hospital was at the front of the room, and there wasn't a lot of conversation. It was really hard to get things rolling. But I'm happy to say that two years later, it's uh, quite a active meeting, lots of people chatting, lots of different companies talking with each other. And everybody stays later after the meeting and talks about other things. So it's great to see all these changes over time. So now after the network was built, we started adding a quarterly meeting that was focused around the hospital. We worked. We had the SNFs that worked most closely with each acute care facility come to a specific meeting at the hospital. And I'll say this level was about a 5,000 foot level. We, short, we would share data. Um, it was blinded, it is still blinded data uh, around the SNFs, around um, link to stay and readmission and uh, cost per case. Um, we would talk about the bundle. If there was a bundle at that particular hospital, we also talked about handoffs, any issues around the emergency room. Really great conversations. A little further in the weeds as far as the hospital goes, um, but we also offered um, education. Like there's one today happening right now, actually at St. Francis, and we're out, um, rolling out post um, here in this market. So that educator is there talking about post. And the last level, um, which is in the weeds in patient care conversations, and that is at the SNF. We can really get specific at these meetings and talk about um, specific issues on both sides of the equation that are really working on uh, patient care. And I'll emphasize that this level is where the deep relationships really get built between the hospital and the SNF. Looking at my time, okay, I need to hurry up. So metrics, uh, we, uh, I won't outline this too specifically, but we asked for data, a lot of data. We collected ourselves through what's available through um, our MSST program, and we also asked the SNFs to give us um, information self-reported, which is real-time. The information we can get is about anywhere from three to six months behind, so we really like to uh, look at what's happening at the SNF directly. And I've tried to ask for information that they are already collecting, either for other entities or um, CMS, um, so um, we just 
we're trying to make sure we're comparing apples to apples when we look at all the information on a monthly basis. So the next I'm going to talk about how we are working our network, how we make the network come alive um, in the hospital and out in the community. And education of all the case key stakeholders is, um, is critical. So um, we do have um, our freedom of choice list that we give to our patients, and we talk about our partners as being bolded and listed first, and the case managers have a very specific script around that. Um, but again, it's... Um, you have to really balance patient choice um, and talking about our network. And I don't know if we have gotten that um, completely um, correct yet, but we are at the constant uh, thing we're uh, working on. Um, the bundle networks is another key. The physician education um, in the bundle networks is very important um, because the docs can make recommendations to their uh, patients if they do need to go to a SNF. They can make a recommendation about what SNF to go to, which SNF to go to, and if they understand our network and those SNFs that are our partners, the better chance that patient might potentially choose a partner SNF to go to if they do need to go to um, a SNF after surgery. Okay, so the fun part, the next one, successes, and I have a big yellow star there because it really is all about the relationships. It really is um, about um, these wins are coming from the relationships we've built. Um, our increased uh, communication with the skilled nursing facilities has been um, nothing short of amazing, I would say. And I'm not talking about more emails because Lord knows I email these SNFs all the time. I'm shocked they haven't blocked me um, on their emails. But I really mean picking up the phone and having conversations. And um, you'll hear more about that from Taylor and then Scott Williamson with the Laurels of Willow Creek who's going to speak in a bit too. Um, I know these administrators and the DONs as um, people, and um, it's not just a place where um, our patients are going. These are people. These are relationships. And um, I think it's um, – that's just – I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, um, as a hospital, also, we've been able to increase our medical group presence in the SNFs, which helps our continuity of care for our patients. And um, we also have um, – some other examples we're going to talk about here, I'm going to talk to, about bundles, our care transitions coalitions across Virginia, the community care team, and as I mentioned, a SNFs perspective. So let me just talk about bundles briefly. Um, you can see the numbers and um, the improvement, and this is specifically at one of our hospitals um, that we have that has hip and knee, and then um, they've also added spine, but this is around the hip and knee uh, bundle. Um, and I know that also Abraham um, talks about that too, about how we're trying to uh, reduce readmissions around the bundle population as well. So the success for this is uh, we started it three years ago, and you can see that the most recent numbers we've really improved. And in the past year, the bundle team at this hospital has gone out into the SNF um, through meeting with the therapy team and the DONs there about what the expectations is around the care pathway for these DRGs in the bundle. And um, I think meeting with them in person has shown them, you know, how we can work together and what their expectation is in the SNF and the, and the readmits and the length of stay have really dropped. And um, I just really think this is a great example. Um, around um, how these relationships have um, made a difference. So I'm going to talk about next, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor Evans, who is a social worker with Bon Secours Richmond, and she's been at the forefront with these community care teams, so I am not going to talk, thank goodness, and let Taylor talk now about the community care team. Thank you. Hi, my name is Taylor. I, as Mary Catherine said, I'm the social worker with the community care team. Um, I started as a case manager at Bon Secours St. Francis and then trans transitioned over to the community care team. Um, I now have a partner, Tammy May, who is a Bon Secours nurse navigator and also nurse practitioner, Laura Finch, who encompasses the community care team. Um, the community care team piloted at St. Francis Medical Center, focusing on Medicare shared savings patients discharged to St. Francis Network skilled nursing facilities. We have now expanded to facilitating patients as they transition from the acute care setting to the skilled nursing facility setting and then back into the community in the Richmond and Hampton Roads market. 
We're tracking these patients through weekly calls with each facility throughout the duration of the patient's stay with the goals listed on the slide. Um, we are working to improve patient outcomes, reduce um, and prevent readmissions through these weekly touches, impact length of stay through specific diagnosis pathways. As Mary Catherine had mentioned, we have uh, shoulder and knee and hip and spine pathways. Uh, we also have COPD pathways and heart failure pathways, which would be about 21 days, and pneumonia looking at a 17-day length of stay. Also, as Mary Catherine said, our, one of our largest goals is to bridge the, cap, the gap between the transitions of each of the care through effective handoff. Back. Yeah, go back one. Um, this one? Yes. Okay. That's so, okay. collectively, the Richmond and Hampton Road markets workflows start by identifying Medicare shared savings patients, heart failure bundle, and other defined high-risk patients. The community care team notifies the SNF of the specific patient within 24 to 48 hours of arrival, and we can conduct those weekly telephonic rounds with each facility to review the patient's progression. And then we provide a synopsis of these meetings to the Bonds Corps nurse navigators in preparation for the next transition of care. In addition, we also track readmission data from the SNF and 30 days post-SNF discharge. So as we take a deeper dive looking into what the community care team telephonic rounds actually consist of, we have to start by looking at what each SNF. So each SNF has identified a team to provide the update in the weekly telephonic rounds. For example, one facility has each discipline fill out a sheet, which is then communicated by the discharge planner to us. Um, another facility includes the community care team in their daily PPS meeting. And another facility prefers to have each discipline on the call with us. So we have their social worker, the director of nursing, and therapy team on the call. We also include our home health representatives on the call for continuity of care. For patients who have chosen Bond Scores Home Health, the Home Health Agency is able to track the progression with us of the patient throughout their SNF stay and then have an idea on how they can continue progressing once the patient's home. During the actual call, for, we cover for each patient um, the hospital. Once they have arrived at the SNF, we, on week one, we discuss the hospital attending discharge summaries and discharge instructions. We discuss any follow-up appointments made in the hospital or pre-arranged appointments. So this is, for example, if pulmonary were to see the patient in the hospital and um, they say that the patient needs to follow up with pulmonary within two weeks of hospital discharge, we can review that with the SNF and know that this patient needs to have transportation arranged or have a family member come get the patient to take them to their follow-up appointments. Um, we also come into um, contact with patients who have pre-arranged appointments. So that's like a sleep study appointment that they had already had pre-arranged prior to their hospitalization that we can review with the SNF to see does, is this an appointment that can be postponed to post-SNF post discharge or does this patient need to attend these specific appointments. Um, if the patient is new and has not had their initial evaluation yet, for example, our meetings are on Tuesdays and this patient arrived on Tuesday morning or Monday afternoon, we are going to review those circle back questionnaire questions. We're going to be ensuring the patient has arrived safely, um, ensuring that those hard scripts were received, and of course, making sure that those SNFs are able to provide excellent care. So once the patient is established at the facility, we start to discuss specific questions like length of stay but based on those diagnosis pathways I referred to earlier, um, progression with therapy and therapy's anticipated length of stay. We talk to the nurses about any medication changes and any barriers to their length of stay or discharge. For example, we had a patient who was having tremors when working with therapy. Well, we talked to nursing and nursing said that the patient had new medication regimen for the tremors and so she was able to start progressing with therapy, but 
by having those tremors initially, that changed the length of stay to now being extended. Um, another barrier we found is that when these um, patients have a home visit scheduled with therapy, therapy will go into the home for the home visit and find there's certain social issues that need to be discussed prior to discharge, which can then um, delay discharge. Also, if a patient is not progressing the way we anticipated, we just start to have the discussion on long-term care, also advanced care planning, um, any hospice discussion. And finally, we schedule PCP appointments prior to the SNF discharge. So once we know that these patients are going to be discharged within a week, we are arranging those appointments for transition of care within three to five days of SNF discharge. My favorite question that is going to be in the next slide is where I'm asked, what are the success stories of the community care team? This is my favorite question because I always want to reply saying all of our patients are success stories. We know by having these collaborations that although we might not have that aha moment of this collaboration is working, we know that it's working because of having these weekly touches. We're talking about these patients regularly. We are making their transition of care appointment within three to five days of discharge so they're able to review their med recs in comparison to med recs before they went into the hospital. Um, we're able to go to over the discharge summaries and we know these are success stories. Um, with that being said, I am able to come up with a few examples. Um, I have three for you where we were able to say hey, this is an aha moment and pat on the back, pat on the back to the community care team collaborating with the SNFs and all of us as a team. We were all able to have success. And I will start with um, we had three patients that were discharged to skilled nursing facility with Foley catheters. Um, when we reviewed the discharge instructions, they indicated that the patients were in need of voiding trials with urology. For different reasons, these patients did not want to go out of the SNF to go to the urologist. One family said they didn't want the patient to go out. Um, the other patient said they'd rather just deal with follow-up appointments once they leave the SNF. So through us reiterating and encouraging the voiding trial with the SNF to the patient, um, the SNF was able to conduct those voiding trials under the direction of the SNF provider, therefore preventing any catheter-associated UTI, um, preventing a chronic Foley, and having the patients and patients' families satisfied. Another story would be during the community care team rounds, the SNF reported the patient was having new onset dizziness. The patient was flagged as a readmission risk. So the community care team was able to review patient's past history before their hospitalization and see that the patient was previous on, previously on anavert for dizziness. We were able to relay this to the SNF and the SNF was able to review the patient history and prescribe anavert therefore preventing an unnecessary ED or admission risk. Finally, we had two patients that were in their mid-90s. The community care team, we had a patient and his wife, both within their mid-90s. Community care team prepared the primary care nurse navigator for the anticipated discharge through handoff. The nurse navigator contacted the patient's wife in order to prepare her for the next transition of care, and the patient's wife expressed to the nurse navigator that the Hoyer lift and hospital bed had not been delivered to the home. At that time, it was 4 o'clock. The patient was anticipated to leave at 5 o'clock, so right there it started a ripple effect. The nurse navigator contacted us with the community care team. We were able to introduce the SNF and call our contacts there who were then able to cancel this unsafe discharge, which would have potentially resulted in a readmission. I think that this not only shows strengthened relationships with the SNF, but also within the PCP, and that we can all collaborate together within one unit for the patient's best interest. That was great, Catherine. That's great. That's wonderful.
a great examples of us uh, how getting in the weeds is really helping patient care and avoiding these possible readmits. So thank you, Taylor, very much. So um, the next uh, slide, Mike, yeah, care transition coalitions. And I'm going to talk kind of fast over these, but they're super important. Carla Thomas, I know, is on the phone and helped us with um, the data we supplied earlier with, uh, and all of the, and she's also the coordinator for all of these care transitions coalitions. And Bonsecor is involved in three of these in the state, in Richmond, Hampton Roads, and then Eastern Virginia. Um, some of the initiatives that we're, we are using and using our network um, another hospital in um, one of these transitions, sorry, one of these coalitions also has a SNF network. So we're utilizing our partners to test these um, initiatives. Um, we already have a built network. We have the relationships. We can educate them in a timely manner through yet another email I can send them or through our quarterly meetings that we get together. Um, we have um, worked on the circle back, as you heard from uh, Taylor with her team, but we also another hospital in, another, uh, in one of the coalitions is using that tool very successfully. Um, we've also talked about the capabilities chest checklist as a potential um, reduction in readmission um, by educating the hospital setting what is available at the SNF. Um, using that interact tool, um, Dr. Boutwell talked about it earlier today in the ED treat and return to SNF. Um, that's a tool there. And uh, the last one is the sepsis initiative, which is a cooperative between uh, VHHA and HQI around the hospitals and SNFs using the same language around sepsis, early detection, and interventions. Um, VHHA handles the hospital side and HQI handles the SNF side. And we're going to use the network, these quarterly meetings we're having in August, to have the hospitals and SNF report together on the work they've done together around sepsis and to look at that. So again, just removing the gaps, removing the barriers between our two organizations on how we can work together to help patients. So now I'm going to introduce Scott Williamson, who's been patiently, hopefully, hearing um, all this great information. But I am, I'm thrilled that he is able to speak from the SNF perspective about his thoughts around um, the relationship and the network. So Scott Williamson is the administrator of the Laurels of Willow Creek, which is a SNF in um, South Richmond. And Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mary Catherine, for inviting me to participate. Um, I guess this may be sound overly simplistic, but I, our experience with the um, partnership with Von Secours is you know, we, ha we have a personal relationship with the hospital administration. Um, you know, I've been, I've been working with St. Francis Hospital and St. Mary's, or St. Francis since that hospital opened. And for years it's always, you know, there's mystery people at the hospital that nobody knows. Well, now we, <laughs> right, so we, know, know, the, we know, the, know the folks there. Um, and, you know, in, in the past we would have, situations where we would have questions about things about what they may have done when we get a patient and, and the same same on their end and we've kind of been left to wonder in the past but what Mary Catherine mentioned about picking up the phone and calling that's really what happened so there's really a, a much higher degree of understanding of what happens on um, on both ends um, we found that you know, we as a SNF, we don't we don't have all the ins and outs and know exactly what's going on in a hospital. We don't know what they're thinking. We don't always know the things that they need, and they also don't really know how we operate. And through our um, monthly and quarterly meetings that we have, they we've really learned about a, a lot about what they need, and the same the same for us. The more specific type things the the teleconferences that we have with Taylor and with the nurse navigator that occur weekly, they are able to help us with, you know, discharge planning is always a big, big concern in nursing facilities. And they're really starting this discharge planning for us prior to the uh, patients coming here. And it's really, we've had situations where it has really assisted us in planning a discharge and maybe even in accepting someone that maybe we would not have in the past and their assistance in helping us get those folks um, discharged. There's, um, we've also had situations where we've been able to have some more preemptive assistance to prevent rehospitalization. 
for example, this, the situation that presents fairly frequently where you have the family who is requesting a trip to the hospital that we don't believe is necessary and you add a whole new level when you can contact the administration of the hospital to have them step in with the ER docs to see if they could do things to help help prevent those rehospitalizations. Um, when Mary Catherine men mentioned the metrics review, we each the hospital setting and the skilled nursing facility, we each have certain metrics that we are measured by, and. Through, through these reviews, they're able to understand our metrics. And when they look at a five-star review, for example, they're now able to understand what those measures mean. And we would definitely weren't there before, before having this. Um, another, just a, I guess a very specific example about a success story was a, was a patient that um, was not a citizen of the United States, also didn't speak English. The hospital had a a really difficult time placing that patient and we were one of the facilities lined up not wanting to take that patient. Well, going back and forth between us and the hospital administration and the patient, um, director of case management and everything, we were able to admit and discharge that patient successfully. So that was just a specific example. Another recent example that prevented a hospitalization was a patient who came with a new colostomy and a supply that we could not obtain because it was on back order. The hospital sent the patient with the supply and then when the patient went through the supplies much quicker than anticipated, they were able to deliver more to us and we prevented a rehospitalization there. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Scott, so much. and. Um, just I'll take this public opportunity to thank you for your partnership with Bon Secours. I really appreciate it, and thanks for talking today. I know sure. we are like super short on time, so I'm going to try and go through what's next really quick. Um, I'm going to pull out some some of these that you can, uh, Mike, if you could forward the slide for me. Thank you. Um, just, I mean, a lot of this you can um, surmise on your own, but the the data collection um, I want to pull out because um, there are lots of hospitals now with SNF networks, and we're all asking a lot of information at a lot, uh, and and asking and demanding a lot from the SNFs, a lot of phone calls, a lot of intervention. So just trying to balance all that for them, so we aren't um, taking them away from taking care of patients. So trying to balance all of that with data collection and uh, information we get with them. Um, Let's see what else to bring out. Um, the reevaluation of the partners in the network. Um, we have done that um, recently, um, which was after two years of being up in the network. We're now going to do that every six months. So that's going to be, um, I think, oh, it's going to be an undertaking, but it's going to be necessary. The landscape in healthcare changes so quickly that I, um, that I think that's going to become a necessary evil for us to do it every six months. But we're looking at the most efficient way that we can do that for ourselves and the partners. And then lastly, what to expect when you go to a SNF. Um, a lot of return to hospital sometimes happens when the patient goes to a SNF because the family and the patient don't know what to expect. It isn't the hospital setting. It's an equally qualified medical setting, but it's different than the hospital. So we want to talk about how the doctor doesn't come every day, how you might see a nurse practitioner, and how you um, are seeing different people in your room and they don't have 15 nurses at your bedside. It's a different setting and we need to set that expectation up so patients aren't, when you saw that slide from HQI earlier about one day, the bounce back, then maybe we can help prevent that by educating our patients in the hospital about what to expect in the SNF setting. So we're working on a brochure and hopefully eventually a um, video that maybe we can show them on an iPad when they're in um, the setting. So um, to finish my portion, I just will reiterate, this is a continual learning process. Bon Secours by no means has figured this all out. We have a lot left to learn, and our partners are um, uh, very gracious in helping us learn as we go across um, improving the care, mining the gaps along the continuum. And um, I still will stress, it is, uh, we need to move from an us and them and move to a we, and I believe this partnership has helped us really move to a we focused on the patient care. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Boutwell with our, what, 30 seconds we have left? I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're good. We've got okay. Extra okay, we good. are good. Okay. We are good.
thank you, Mary Catherine. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Scott. Uh, what a deep and rich discussion. And, and again, um, you, you can tell um, that uh, really the work uh, that, that what we can learn from Bonds Corps is uh, relationships, relationships, relationships. Pick up the phone. Uh, Scott said it. Taylor lives it every day with her uh, care transitions team. Uh, Mary Catherine leads the development and fostering of these effective, trusting, mutually beneficial relationships. And so the other thing I really uh, gleaned out of this deep dive was um, multifaceted components, such that in quality improvement, we all need to start somewhere. Uh, starting somewhere might be convening a meeting, uh, looking, you know, looking at data, looking at root causes. But um, there is a portfolio of efforts that we um, heard about, um, and really, I've always I have learned that um, hospitals get success when they have a portfolio of strategies. So too would it apply here that hospital SNF collaborations would also need to adopt and manage and actively foster a portfolio of efforts, just like we heard. Um, from this example. So thank you so much. Um, and undoubtedly, your collective patients are doing uh, much better because of what you've um, put in place for them. So as we wrap up, uh, we, uh, as Abraham noted, um, there is an opportunity here for, for an extra 30 minutes, that, um, if I remember correctly, of discussion time. And so just to remind you, for those of you who have the time, uh, there, we will um, move, uh, wrap up the webinar component and move into discussion. And so um, I invite you to check your calendars and see if you can stay on for that. Uh, just in, in, in concluding the webinar component before we get to the discussion is I would encourage you to take from this webinar today uh, the importance of using data to, to guide your outcomes-oriented cross-set and collaborations to target your improvement efforts based on the root causes of readmissions. Uh, the very last root cause that Mary Catherine said is next for them to tackle is uh, what do patients and their families know about the skilled nursing environment. And it sounds like a root cause of some of their um, avoidable readmissions is not quite understanding uh, what the skilled nursing environment is. And that's a very common one. And so um, targeting uh, uh, root um, your improvement efforts to really get to the why patients get readmitted is, is always a, an important um, guiding concept. Develop those personal working um, relationships. And as Scott said, um, you know, the, what differentiates um, his relationship with Mary Catherine is there's a, a human being. It's a personal relationship, not um, an organization, nameless, faceless, um, someone somewhere that, um, that, that we don't really know. Manage patients discharged not only from hospital to SNF, but as Taylor um, so uh, so well um, uh, described, managing uh, during the SNF stay and SNF to home. It's the entire patient journey, and that's really the exciting thing about this work is 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 we're we're managing uh, the entire patient journey, and and that's a new that's new work. It's new skills. It's a new frame, and it's what keeps me interested in 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 uh, pursuing these changes. And then finally, um, from time to time, you may find that you need to create new options. Um, uh, again, the, the, the virtual rounding we heard, uh, we also heard in the Bon Secours that uh, there's some more collaboration with um, ED docs and, and the medical practice and, and making sure that we're mobilizing services while the patient is in the skilled nursing environment in order to best um, meet their needs without uh, needing to return to the hospital. So, so much to think about. Um, Hopefully you see in these five recommendations opportunities that are reasonable, feasible, and actionable for any of you in the hospital or skilled nursing uh, facility um, sectors to, to, to really think uh, about and take away from today's meeting. So with that, I'll thank you for uh, your uh, attention today. Thanks for your commitment to reducing readmissions. And Abraham, why don't I turn it back over to, to you? Um, I'll take your lead on the discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Botwell. Um, I will ask Mike to flip back to our slide that says question and discussion. As Dr. Botwell noted, we have allocated some additional time this morning 
uh, for questions and discussion. So we understand that some of you might need to leave us, but for those of you that would like to ask a question of Dr. Boutwell, of myself, on behalf of the association, of um, April Payne from VHCA, or from our colleagues from Bon Secours or Scott from the SNF setting, um, we have opportunity. So to ask a question, you can type your question into the question box, and we will read it and respond to it. If you'd like to ask a question verbally, you just hit the hand icon to raise your hand, and we will be able to unmute your line, and we will be able to respond to your question um, it, it, once you ask it verbally. And so we will give folks a few minutes. We'll look for any questions that are being typed in, or we'll look for any hands being raised. Um, we have a hand raised by from Susan Vaughn. Susan, your line's unmuted. Susan, are you with us? Susan, do you have your phone muted? All right. um, Susan, we are unable to hear you. So perhaps you can try typing your question into the question box. Um, Mike, do we have any other hands that are raised we can try? We have no other hands raised. Let's check the question box and see if there are any questions. Wow, perhaps that means that all the information we provided was up. Hello? So we're checking our question box and we see no, um, we, we do have one question that just came in. Um, Victoria asks, may I have a list of typical members of a community care team? For example, a SNF, um, DON, a case manager, and a social worker. Um, anyone want to speak to that? Um, typical members of a community care team? So each facility recognizes their and appoints their own, but yes, I would say most SNFs um, have their social worker, um, DON, and physical therapy, occupational therapy on the call. Um, Some of our facilities, like I was saying before, some of our facilities say that they have um, each discipline write a note on each patient, and then they have one um, person communicate each discipline role. Great. Thank you very much, Taylor. Um, we're going to try to see if we can get um, Bronwyn Harvey who's raised a hand. Do you have a question? You're yes. unmuted. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Hello? you. Hi. Um, good morning. This has been um, great. Um, uh, kudos to everybody and all the hard work that everyone's doing. Um, I did have a question about the um, care coordinators through transitions of care. Did you all have to increase your FTEs for this? Um, and if so, how many do you have that are performing these duties? Hey, you're talking about the um, community care team? Yes. The one that's making the rounds? No, um, we reallocated um, those folks into roles, so no, we did not create any additional FTEs. Um, originally, the plan was to do it in person. But we did not have, I mean, we just found with the amount of patients that we had, um, our high-risk uh, Medicare shared savings patients, that we just could not physically do that. So we switched to the telephonic. Ideally, it would be in person. Um, and if your market um, is small enough that you can do that, I think we, as I think Taylor and I both agree that the in-person is great, just like the building relationships that I do in my role. But as far as the care, um, community care teams, we did not create any new FTEs. We, reallocated um, folks to this work. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and did you reallocate them from out of the hospital or um, were they already existing in your post-acute 
And are no, they made? Are they made no, up of all lesbians or? <laughs> so yeah, I got uh, so you do, and it's great questions. Um, so no, it was um, hospital folks. These people worked in the hospital setting. Um, um, either that, when I say hospital, I should say the medical group also, because that's where the nurse practitioners have come from. Is from our Bon Secours medical group that are um, that do this work. And then the, um, Taylor, the social worker, came out of the hospital. She was at St. Francis, uh, one of our hospital uh, settings. Um, so it's all hospital. Bon Secours only owns three skilled nursing facilities, and they're in the Hampton Roads area. All these other partners are outside entities. Um, we do not own them. So. The work that I'm speaking of and Taylor on um, the team out of the, is out of the hospital. So the community care team is out of the hospital system driven, reaching into the SNFs. And then as um, Taylor just answered, then she was referring to the SNF team that is um, that calls that we call into or they call into us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. So one of the questions we received earlier was, um, how long do the telephonic rounds typically take with each sniff? And are there lessons about how to be efficient with the rounds? Yes, so a typical round um, depends on how many patients, uh, usually about two to three minutes per patient. Um, I would say when we have, some of our sniffs have the upward of 10 to 15 patients that we review per call. And it also just depends on if they're new, um, Newer patients take a little bit longer just because we're doing a deep dive into going over their discharge summary, going over those circle back questions, um, reviewing any medications, and also then once the patients are established there, we are able to just say, are they still on track? Are they still, are we still on track for discharge at this date? Are there any barriers that are preventing that or any updates? Um, and those go pretty smoothly. So I'd say about two to three minutes per patient. And Taylor, do you conduct weekly calls with all 28 SNFs in your network? So the, myself and Tammy are the Richmond Market Community Care Team. Um, we call 14 facilities throughout the week. And then Hampton Roads as well calls 14 facilities. So it's two different sets. It's two teams, one the Hampton Roads area, one here. But they're just two people each team for each market. And we have 14 and 14 the Richmond Market and the Hampton Roads. But you are talking to the SNF. Yes. Each SNF gets a call every week. Yes. So each SNF um, does get a call each week. We've met with them to see what is the best day for them, what's the best time, and we all call into a conference line um, at the designated time and day. Great. Thank you. Um, let's, we'll check to see if we have any more questions in our question box. Um, we see no more questions in the question box, um, no more hands raised. Um, well, we'll just remind folks that when you log out of the webinar today, um, you will get a survey. We ask that you take a few minutes to complete the survey. Um, we will be meeting collectively as a team to review your feedback as we plan further um, um, activities between the hospital and the SNFs across Virginia. Um, so let me just check once more. Um, we've got one more question. How do you manage transition SNF to home? Is it a telephonic management? So can anyone speak to that? Mm -hmm. So through, when we have a Bon Secours Medical Group patient, we are able to send our notes virtually that we're using through our system, Connect Care. Each time we send a note, we write a note to chart on these patients. We're able to send them to their nurse navigator in the primary care provider office. Um, other than that, we're arranging those PCP appointments prior to discharge and letting the patients know that they need to have their discharge summary. We also have, the, um, we send or the SNF is going to be sending the discharge summary and med rec to the PCP for the next transition. Also, by having Bon Secours Home Health, we have them also included on our line. So Bon Secours Home Health can then track the patient and pick up where we left off. And a part of that too is, and I didn't mention this, is um, through our network we've now 
opened up a Connect Care link, an electronic medical record link for our skilled nursing facilities in the network so they can view the chart. Um, it's a 35-day read only, and that was uh, launched in April, so that's helped um, the SNFs take better care of the patients because they can see the chart just as we have, so they can see updates of notes as well for those 35 days, so that helps in the transitions. But yeah, part of the community care team is making sure that it is a more than a warm handoff back to their next stop after they leave the SNF, because as we know from Carla's slides, the um, short turnaround time after they go home, so making sure the SNF to home, whether it's with home health or what's the next step is um, planned before they leave the SNF. So yes, the community care team is vital with that, and it is telephonic at this time, um, like we mentioned before. Great. Uh, we'll do one final check of our question box. Um, so we do have another question. Is there a template other than the six questions to collect and trend inf information received from your weekly contact with the SNFs? So um, the circle back, I believe, is what you're talking about with those six questions. So um, there's that information, as Taylor talked about, um, collecting that info if a patient has just arrived and it's time for their telephonic uh, weekly check-in. But the rest information actually gets put back in their chart, and that is um, something we're looking at too. That is a time-consuming part of this process, but it's, but it's essential. So the um, nurse practitioner with Taylor, Tammy May, she will input that information back into the chart. Um, so that's how that information is kept. So anything that's collected in those circle back questions would be a part of the um, charting if need be. But those circle backs are really to identify any um, initial gaps that we can take back to the hospital about, you know, the, the hard scripts needing to come or if information didn't show up as we promised it would, that's where we can go back as a hospital and check on our systems to make sure our discharge to the post-acute are the best they can be. So, yep, all that information gets tabulated, but most of the info on the telephonic check-ins every week go back into the chart for the patient. Great. Thank you very much, Donna, for that question. Um, let's see. Make sure we get all the questions. Don't see any more questions. Don't see any more hand raised. Um, and so we thank you all that were able to spend the additional time with us this morning. We will go ahead and end this morning's call. Dr. Boutwell, we always appreciate you being with us and sharing your insights and your experience from around the country. April, very glad to have you with us and really enjoying the partnership with BHCA. And of course, our colleagues from Bon Secours and Scott, um, glad to have you all with us. And we look forward to a much more collaboration over the next several weeks and months. Everyone have a great day. Thanks for being with us today.